Now, let's see here. Let me get this figured out. We are live on Facebook. Are we oh, live on snap. Facebook? Okay. Okay, I think I've got that figured out. Hey guys. So, this is the new song project format. And my first guest of the new era is uh, Paul Abner, uh, tinfoil top hat. He's brought Eddie, bass player. Eddie, what's your last name? Faye. Eddie Faye and Paul Abner from Tinfoil Top Hat, one of the uh, hot new young bands out of Seattle. Is that what we are now? I think so. Sweet. Is that what they say? I don't know that anybody's ever said that, but they should. Now, I am going to be monitoring this live here. Um, there we go. But I don't want sound on it because that'll be weird. Okay. That's why I can feel like those old uh, radio yeah. call ins. We'd like, we'll try to turn, turn you a little bit this way. <laughs> You have to uh, please uh, to the um, millions of people out there watching this feed right now, uh, or the one Tracy upstairs. Um, <laughs> uh, we may have some technical hurdles to overcome here. We'll see how it goes, um, or even how we want us to start. I, I was thinking um, perhaps we'll start by you guys just playing a song, okay? And then uh, the. The format that we're going to be doing, uh, as opposed to the way it's been for a long time, is um, uh, performance, but interspersed with with more talk about songwriting and the process. And I've got a whole list of questions here to ask you. Good. And uh, more things for me to get wrong. <laughs> and of all the people uh, in the world who were clamoring, clamoring at my door uh -huh. to do this, right, and be the the first guest, you were the one that I wanted. Nice. Um, mostly because you and I have had a lot of conversations about songwriting, so yeah. I feel like it's a, a comfortable place for me to start, rather than somebody I don't know as well or don't know their songs as well, things like that. But um, so they're being like, what also the because hell, I got man? mad respect for you as a songwriter. Mad respect. Not as a human, but just no, as no, a no, songwriter. No, clearly, yeah. No, terrible <laughs> human. I am. I really am. Yeah, there are plenty of people who would sign on to that petition. <laughs> All right, so yeah, why don't you guys pick a song and, and we'll start off. And this is my studio, by the way. You can see the beautiful guitars on the back. Um, well, they're not all so beautiful, but all right. Well, That's go for right. it, guys. What are you going to play for well, us? What do you want to start with? Um, so, uh, what are you on? Do you want to do Fair Warning? Um, on we'll wait on that one. Okay. It's, um, Let's start with Halfway Home. It was a good sound check for us. We'll start with it. We're sort of familiar with it. So yeah, this one's called Halfway Home. <clears throat> it's on the album that Tinfoil Top Hat released in July. And you can find that anywhere, literally anywhere. Wouldn't say 
walking down in you Song, I'm have to skip around here and go to my question that was directly about that song. Oh, um, all right. Uh, a couple questions, actually. Uh, I always have loved the sort of the double meaning of halfway home mm -hmm. as like being halfway home, but also a halfway home. Uh, was that an intentional thing from the beginning? Or? Yeah, I, I, I throw those things in my songs. I do that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I try not to be, um, God, I don't want to pick on him right from the gate. I, I try not to be uh, like Jason Mraz. Like, I try not to be, uh, like, I try not to, to make those things like the, the central point of, hey, look at my lyrics. Aren't they clever? Right, Hello, right. Look at my wordplay. Um, but I do like wordplay. I think most people who write lyrics enjoy a little bit of wordplay now and right, then. So. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, Okay, so there's a line in there. We left heaven by the road, broken down and useless. They never told us it would carry even the most faithful halfway home. What does that mean to you? Uh, that's actually one of the more... Um, uh, it's, it's pretty direct. Uh, I, anybody who's listened to uh, a good portion of my music knows that I uh, poke fun at religion quite a bit because I think it's um, it's quite silly bullshit <laughs> <laughs> and so and that line kind of means exactly what it what it implies which is uh, these notions that there's some other reward and there's something else that we should strive for and that at some point if you really want to get anywhere you just have to put those things down and and most of us carry those things far enough through our lives that by the time we put them down, we're going to be lucky to get halfway to where we could have been right. if we weren't carrying them in the first place. Right, right. But those things are useless, and and we should put them down. It's the, you know, we we kind of get that that notion on, uh, you know, on social media a lot where people are like, oh yeah, sending thoughts and prayers, you know, that's like okay, good, that's useless, it's worthless. Right. So I saw something today that said that. Maybe that's what we should, instead of building a wall, we could just use yeah, thoughts, and, use prayers thoughts and, and prayers. So that's exactly. a reason for, for school, to protect against right, school exactly, violence. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, and that really is what the line means. It's like, uh, thoughts and prayers. yeah, it's, it's, it's useless. It's, right. So you mean that, like, we left heaven by the road, just sort of like, this is the point, I'm leaving this behind. Right, exactly. Like, it's useless. Yeah. Forget about it. Yep. Cool. Cool, that's a good tune. I've always liked that one. Yeah. yeah, I wrote that song. It's, it's probably, oh, it's got to be about four years that ago now. That was a song prompt one, wasn't it? Because of the First Avenue thing made me, yeah, remember, made me remember I that. I don't remember what the prompt was, though. I remember uh, doing a prompt where you had to use uh, like a street name. Yeah. And I feel like that was that one. Might have been that one. Because um, there's that one line you say something about uh, Yeah. something on First Avenue. Yeah, that was actually, a, um, that, that line is actually a reference to... Uh, our little song project family and our little lost home there oh yeah on first avenue yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's what that was a reference to nice oh. yeah. yeah our little old forgotten stretch of first avenue where yeah we used to, where you used to all meet right yeah right. for that brief shining moment on the that's hill. right that's right <laughs> <laughs> um 
So how did you, to jump a little bit here, but how did you first get into songwriting? Like, how old were you? What were the circumstances there? Um, I got my first guitar when I was nine. And the first song that I learned how to play was 16 Tons. <laughs> 16 tons. I don't know that one. Yeah, yeah. I probably do. 16 but... tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sing Ernie. yeah, and which must have been, I, I would guess, fairly adorable to watch a nine-year-old <laughs> sing this old <laughs> labor song. Uh, that was the first song I learned how to play. And Did this, you take to it immediately, like to the guitar? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not like I really, you know, immediately grasped all the intricacies well no i mean everybody sucks when so they pick it up but i mean did it did it spark in you like oh i found something i love yeah i really yeah. liked it yeah and then the second song i learned how to play was um blue eyes crying in the rain oh i was that's uh, a great song it's a great song and then uh i think the sir the third song that i learned how to play was probably one that i wrote okay and so I started writing songs really, really young, and I'm oh, wow. sure they really sucked, but I couldn't tell you the first song I wrote. It's oh, well, that darn, long. that was going to be my next question, is if you could remember Can't what your remember. first song was. I could not tell you at this point what it was. Do you remember those early songs that when you first started writing, were they, I mean, for most of us, the first songs we write are, like, tend to be very derivative of whatever we love at the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. um, what was the thing that was, were you like Willie Nelson kind of thing? Or? Well, I, I imagine I probably wasn't writing like songs about Voltron and He-Man, which is really <laughs> what I was into at the time. But <laughs> since I couldn't tell you what my first song was, it might have been a, a Ode to Voltron. I mean, couldn't tell you otherwise. Right. So. Yeah, you know, when I first started writing, it was, I had gone to see the Ramones play, uh -huh. and up till then I'd been playing bass in a band that did like cl covers of classic rock, you know? Sure. And I went and saw the Ramones and I was like, oh my God, number one is like super easy. They're just playing like three chords. And I could, and, and I could write, it was, there was something about that DIY thing of punk, you know, and I think I went home that night and wrote like seven songs can't remember a single one of them but they were these horrible like hardcore punk songs you know that were like yeah maybe a minute 20 long <laughs> like, it's like wah, right and, 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 so <laughs> long punk songs really yeah they were yeah pretty yeah they were, they were kind of yeah I, I do remember um that even as a uh little nine ten year old kid um i was still wired the same way that i'm wired now so i remember um just practicing a lot of chords Mm. Like I just, I, I felt like I really just needed to get better at the instrument. Right. So there was a lot of um, <clears throat> practicing technique in a vacuum, even at a very right. young age. Well, that's that Which, has served you well. I mean, that's a, yeah, that's a and, good trait to have. And, yeah, uh, and nobody told me to do that. I'm just um, crazy. I mean, that's good <laughs> crazy. <laughs> no, just, I mean, so know. I was wired that way at a very young age. Right. Just like. Right try to get things right right so yeah you know i i don't know if it was uh maybe growing up in an orchestra family for me but being forced from age four to play do uh -huh. violin lessons all yeah. that stuff for me practice was like freaking pulling fingernails you know what i mean like i just hated it right and that's never really changed <laughs> 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 yeah. but i you know and and to my detriment because now I've been playing guitar for 30 some years and what do I have to show for it? I know guys that have been playing guitar for 10 years that can play circles around me in their sleep. Well, yeah. With a broken too. hand. But me too. I mean, I mean yeah, I know. There's, some, I know. there's some guys out there that are just, um, yeah. they're, they're, they're replicants, man. They, right. You can't, you can't compare yourself to some of these dudes. No. They're just, they're not, they're not but, okay. But, but at the same time, I do recognize that like, boy, you know, if I had said, if I had, it's age, 14 when I picked up a guitar if I had been like oh, I'm gonna play the guitar for two hours every single day you know right yeah mm -hmm. because and you and I have had this discussion about creative processes before that that it's 95 percent effort yeah because we're because Will. humans are innately creative and the idea to me that there's like that artists have some special hold over creativity 
you know, to me, kind of demeans the art itself because it's yeah. saying, well, you only do this because you have some God given talent. Right, right. And, and the, yeah. That everyone else doesn't have. And, and it takes, uh, I think you've said it best, uh, as best as I've heard anybody say it, um, that uh, talent is just the price of admission. It right. does take it right. does take a certain amount of, of yeah I mean there's there's tone deaf people, grasp of you know the, yeah yeah of the yeah. situation at hand right you know? like um, you know I was I was never destined to be an Olympic swimmer you know right. there are certain things that just right. you have to be born with but, but if you went to a pool for four hours a day I'd be a much much you'd be much a kick ass swimmer. swimmer exactly right. yeah right um, and the the problem is that uh, a lot of times um, artists kind of perpetuate that in oh absolutely and uh because we want to be seen as special because right. there's also a lot right. of um, it's a med- fragile narcissism going <laughs> right, around right and it's again it's like gatekeeping and in any mm-hmm. sort of society or group or guild right. there's a there's a sense of gatekeeping like right. you know this isn't not everybody could do this people this is a special thing right. and, <laughs> and artists they they do it to each other too oh absolutely um, they they play their cards very close to their chest um usually to their own detriment right um because the only way to to really develop uh a love for the, what they're doing and develop a scene around that and get people interested in it is to invite more people into it right it's the only way for that to right. be a healthy right. thing right and so when they're scrounging around for one or two gigs a month that are unpaid it's because well you're all acting like Right, the mage on top of the hill. Right, and right. you're all shooting yourselves in the foot. Right, so. right. I love it how some artists say that. Oh, it just comes through me. Right, it's like yeah. it's like it's from yeah. heaven right. or something. Right, yeah. right. I'm just the vessel. Yeah, or, right. you know, it's just floating out there, and I grab it. Yes. and I mean, and I don't disbelieve that there are plenty of artists who believe that is true, mm-hmm. because that's the narrative they use to explain the universe. I just right. don't think that it is factually true. <laughs> no, I've, I've had those moments. Me too. You know. you know, but if I sat around waiting for those moments, I wouldn't be a musician. Right, right. Like, if that's what you're sitting around waiting for, then do something and, else. In my mind, any prolific good artist who claims that is lying either to us or to themselves. Mm-hmm. And in reality, they, they have a very specific effort that they put into it, that they choose to, to narrate as waiting for the muse. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, they're not just literally not doing anything musical until something sort of floats out of the void, and then they're like, oh, I must write a song. Right. They're no. clearly not doing that. No. You know? no that's, that's not happening. <laughs> no. And the, the, the few times in my life that that's happened for me, I mean, my entire catalog would fill up half an EP, you know? Like, right. Come on. Right, right. That's the thing, yeah. Um, so going back to those early days, um, what kind of support did you get when you were first learning? Like, were your parents pretty supportive? No. No? No, none. Really? Yeah. I, I, were they just, like, apathetic, or were they actively, like, bad idea? No, they were not actively bad idea. It was just... They weren't dissuading you. No, they just... They, yeah, it was just... It's like, oh, it's a phase yeah, kind whatever. of thing. Yeah, yeah. My my uh, I got my first guitar for Christmas. My auntie gave it to me, um, and it came with uh, one of those you know Ernie Ball how to play you know Volume One right right um, things you know, and uh, and she would write down you know chords for songs for me and you know send them in the mail and, and things like that. This was oh, this was nice. back in the day. Um, you probably both remember this where we had this thing called the. Um, the U.S. Postal Service, and mm. mail would come in paper form. Weird. Yeah, so... Um, Is that what they use snails for nowadays? When yeah. They, describing that? Yeah, they use... Yeah, they ride them on the backs of snails. Boy, now. it really slipped a long way from the Pony Express to right. uh, and, uh, using I, snails. I think, I think PETA should get on that. They should. Honestly, those snails should. don't have that coming. Um, it's a slimy thing to do to them. So it's not I love PETA. Like, PETA, it's a tasty... It is. It's... it's, it's Convenient for holding a lot of meat. It's yeah, it's you know, flat, but it doesn't feel flat. Right. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good. Um, <laughs> you guys have known each other way too. <laughs> uh, yeah. So then, yeah, when I was a kid, I would just pick up whatever I could from whoever I could. I had um, by the time I got to to junior high, I had friends whose 
parents were sending them to music lessons, and so I was gleaning what I could from them. Mm. Um, I had this uh, I had this friend all through school who uh, his parents sent him to take organ lessons and trumpet lessons, and so he he kind of had some knowledge that I wanted. And right. While all the 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 cool kids were outside, you know, like playing basketball and stuff like that. We were inside giving each other like ear training problems and theory problems. So, so was, your interest in theory also started pretty early in, in there. That's fortunate. Yeah, because I was pretty sure that um, even from a really young age, I was pretty sure I wasn't uh, talented enough to ride on that, but I was probably smart enough to mm. ride on that. Right, right. I hear. So, I see what you're saying. Sure, sure. I've always thought that I was probably more intelligent than I was talented. <laughs> so <laughs> I try to play to that strength. A little right, bit. right. Well, that's, I mean, that kind of makes sense to me, really, because my very first impressions of your songs were uh, very head-oriented yeah, rather yeah. than uh, gut-oriented. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, that's definitely, uh, that's definitely a more learned kind of right. Right. avenue for me. I sometimes wonder if, like, when I first came to, to Sorry, if my first exposure to the idea of writing and composing hadn't, disregarding my classical upbringing, because I really thought of those things as very separate from what I did with the guitar, it was all, you know, it was the punk, it was the Ramones, it was Black Flag, it was these, you know, these, these punk bands that played the most, you know, Distorted basic chords, yeah. no substitutions, no you know, no theory really. It was just these you know, it was all primal raw stuff. Right. And sometimes I wonder, like, what if my intro into songwriting had come through, you know, listening to Herbie Hancock or uh, you know, so more of a someone who's you know, artists that were more advanced or Stevie Wonder, you know, someone who has yeah, yeah, yeah. a uh, uh, this greater depth of, of theoretical understanding, if that would have made a difference in terms, it probably would have. I mean, you know, road not taken or anything. Uh, right. I mean, we latch onto whatever we latch on when we're that, right. that age, though. But I feel like even though there's a lot of things that I that I look back on and thank for that because like it started me off with this this good gut feeling about music, you know, like it was like real uh, sort of chaotic or in a sense like it was like just like id you know yeah uh and and it made me focus on the basics but it also you know it definitely it took, made me take much longer than it should have to come to the understanding of like oh the importance of right something slightly more complex happening musically yeah when i when i started writing songs at like nine ten years old it was a lot of like in my house it was a lot of um Eurythmics and Manhattan Transfer and Yaz and things See, like that's that good. going See, on that's the record great. player. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm like, wow, this this is cool right, shit. Right. And, and see, yeah. that's what I lacked because with my parents, even though they're both musicians, they're both you know classical musicians and trained, they didn't listen to music really much at home. What they had was like LPs of like the you know Beethoven's Complete Symphonies or something. Sure. Like we listened to no popular music. In our house, yeah. mm -hmm. not like for any kind of. It wasn't like it was banned. They just didn't. They weren't wasn't really music listening yeah. people, uh, so they didn't mm -hmm. listen to any bands from the '60s or anything. They weren't into any of that stuff. Oh, wow. All they did was listen to classical music, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I never had that. I never had that atmosphere around me of like growing up in a in a musical. You know, plus I was my early years in India. I didn't have exposure to the radio. Sure. I mean, there was nothing. I didn't hear anything. I think yeah. my parents had like one cassette tape that had. The Beatles on one side and the Birds on the other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. And, and Jesus Christ Superstar was probably like, you know, oh, that's not the that's closest not, thing to rock music I heard for ages, which I don't regret at all because no, it's no. freaking brilliant. That's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, let's get back to some music. Okay. Let's play another song. Okay. What you want to play? Another song. Okay. Um, I like that idea. Yeah. Let's. Uh... I guess I should play. I, I guess I should talk about a song before I play it, maybe. Or well, if you want to go, like, okay, I've got. I tell you what, I've got questions about Celeste. Oh, good. Die in my sleep, clairvoyant, 
So all three of those I've got specific questions about. If you want to. All right. Well, uh, let's let's do clairvoyance since we didn't actually prepare the other two. Not oh, and we, you do have a new song. You have a new song for me too. I did promise a new song, and I will deliver. Yeah, all right. I actually will deliver. Um, okay, so let's do clairvoyance. Um, you want to ask questions first or after? Um, in turn, every wave that I create returns. Is that sort of a karma thing? Kind of. It's the song. Okay, so the song is really about. Um, in that sense, it's about patterns. Mm. It's about recognizing uh, other people's behavior and other people's choices and your own behavior and your own choices. Um, so clairvoyant is about. It's, it's really about the clash of two different kinds of people. There are two. There are two kinds of people in this world who. Are never wrong. The first is the person who has seen enough of what's going on around them to recognize patterns in themselves and patterns in other people and know based on people's behavior around them what is most likely going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And they've just seen enough and been through enough that they're probably right. Right. The other kind of person who's never wrong is a person who's in a position of authority and doesn't have to be. And so the song is kind of about what happens when those two things don't necessarily line up. Okay, okay. And so when you have somebody who's in a position of authority and doesn't have to be wrong, so they're never wrong, and the kind of person who has seen enough to know, oh, I know what's coming, what happens when you throw those kinds of people into a mix and who comes out on top? Right. So that's kind of the underlying theme of the song. The song, um, and I'll just, I guess I'll just leave the, the lyrics at that. It's kind of a, a heady um, explanation. Kind of sounds like you clairvoyantly wrote it about Trump long before he was in <laughs> office. <laughs> I have foreseen it. <laughs> Which I guess puts you in the first category. <laughs> I am definitely not in the second category. I, kind of, I am allowed to be wrong. Well, you might. My, my take on it was actually quite similar to that, but it was it. I got the second category wrong. I was thinking of it in terms of uh, just more general, like magical thinkers. You know, similar to Halfway Home, right? Uh, as sort of the uh, the central conflict being between what I would call magical thinking and rational thinking, mm -hmm. right? Like the magical narratives, which would kind of, it kind of fits into that same thing of like, say it's someone in authority, but magical thinking, there is this other authority. So you don't really have to be wrong, right? Because right. none of your, none of your prep propositions are provable. And so therefore it really doesn't matter if they're true or not, right. they're not if they're factual or not. It seems like yeah. that's the kind of category of people that I would write about, and often do, but I didn't this time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I don't know why. Now, to pick apart lyrics a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I feel comfortable asking you these questions because I think you're a much more intentional lyric writer than I am. I tend to write a lot of sort of evocative sure. lyrics rather than, you know, pinpoint lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, so I will ask you what a couple of these things mean, um, and I'm not sure if they're, if they're specific or not, but uh, so we, we tried to walk away and this haiku brings us back. Is that referring to something specific? <laughs> sort of. That was that line right there was the entire impetus for all of the other lyrics in the song. It's interesting, interesting that, that I that picked one that one out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm one of those people that okay. sees the patterns. I guess so. <laughs> so here's how this came about, and you can all laugh at me. After I tell oh, you. Oh, sorry. So I, this was this was the result of one of our song challenges, and the song challenge was to use um, an A and an E minor. Oh, I remember that one. song. That was the very first one, I think. And I think it was, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, well, everybody's going to say that's a one minor five, and I think everybody pretty much did. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, well, that's not what I'm going to do then. So, and so I just I had this uh, this line here this. <laughs> This figure here, you've got an A and a second and third, you've got your E in the bass there. And I can move this pattern here, same exact. 
exact figure, if I move it down two frets, that turns into an E minor. Okay, so I'm just like, that fills the, that fills the, the requirement for the challenge right there, right? There's an A major, same figure here, turns it into an E minor. Boom. It's like a totally inverted A major. Though. Yeah, exactly. So, right? Like, challenge the accepted, on the top. challenge done. Right. So I had this... Which is totally the way anybody else interpreted that. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's where the song started, and then I just kind of I wrote all of the instrumentation after that. The the instrumental, the chords and all the, the instrumental stuff just came together really well. Could not come up with a lyric for this song to save my life, which is funny considering how lyric heavy the damn thing is uh, at the end of that process. But I was talking to a friend of mine. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I got this song, I've got all the instrumentation done, I can't figure out any lyrics, and he's like, what, you can't just write some haiku for all those Asian guys you've been dating lately? <laughs> 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 Which turned into a conversation with this friend of mine about... Asian guys. Be uh, behavioral patterns. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> and so the whole thing kind of fell open from there and it became a song about behavioral patterns and how yeah you do enough things enough times and you can just see how it's going to play out every single time and it's never any different so that's 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 that line we try right. to walk away this haiku brings us back it's that right. that line is a reference to these right. one string after the next of these same exact people right no it's like the, it's like the saying of like uh you know keep trying keep doing the same thing expecting different results right you know? yeah <laughs> and and you know to be perfectly fair i didn't particularly care to to, to get different results i was perfectly happy with the <laughs> results right. i was getting so <laughs> you go uh, girl i'm like i'm fine with these results i'm okay with this so and i'm okay and i was okay with it until i wasn't anymore and then you know things change so yeah, I was not unhappy with the results, but I was also not, you know, um, under any illusion that the results were going to be different. I mean, right. patterns are right. what they are, you know. If you couldn't predict the end, then it wouldn't be a pattern, it would right. be something else. Have you ever read um, Isaac Asimov's Foundation? Twice. Because it reminds you, <laughs> it makes me think of psychohistory. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. that's exactly what that is. It's right. like looking at the looking patterns right. of humans as a group. Right. To be able to gonna, predict behaviors, yeah. and, uh, which I've done, I know when the universe will come to an end. Yeah, the thousand years of the dark eventually age eventually will begin at a certain point yet to be di disseminated. Twenty sixteen November. <laughs> 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 the dark age has begun. Believe me. <laughs> okay, well let's hear it. Okay, let's hear about these patterns, these so-called patterns of yours. I'll try not to mess up this guitar part that I already wrote that's just too hard for me to play. I, I do I do that sometimes.
so long silence again when you're gone the space you leave will be filled before too long keeping this at bay is like trying to hold the waves back by filling every listening to you doing this and so I know that with Tinfoil Top Hat you are not the singer right. any longer of your own material right as a songwriter <clears throat> what was that process like was it hard to let go uh, is it an ongoing process how, it's how ongoing that... definitely that's the word I was going to use um, because it is a process um, it was not hard for me to let go of that uh, job um, I was eager to let go of that job uh, because I, I don't think that in a setting like this uh, where it's just me and a guitar um, I think my voice uh, speaks these songs well yes um, in a larger setting where there's more instrumentation Mm. I think my voice doesn't necessarily speak these songs very well. Um, so I was looking for somebody that uh, could do that, and and so found Peter, and he's got an amazing voice. Yes, he does. Um, but it's it's definitely an ongoing process because uh, it's not just difficult for like it's difficult for me to like give the salient information about the song mm. because I don't necessarily know what that is for another singer. Right. I also don't want to get in the way of another singer's artistic process. Like, he's he's got to find his own footing with the material. Right, right. So I kind right. of, you know, in a lot of a lot of the time I wait for him to, to ask the questions that he needs to ask 
Um, if I don't feel like he's getting it, then I'll, you know, step in and try to guide one way or the other. Right. And he's good at taking uh, guidance that way, which has been really nice because a lot of singers aren't. So, right. he, but he's he's really good about um, like he just doesn't have any kind of like weird hangups about taking right. guidance that way. Um, and so I was I was I was eager to to, to let go of that. Uh, responsibility because it also gets in the way of my guitar playing. Right. Um, there. Are, I definitely understand that. Even in, in settings like this, like it's fine because, um, because it's 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 more of a more of a like a, a folk setting where I don't really have to do a whole bunch of complicated things. Right. But right. when I'm on stage with a drummer and a bass player and a singer and I'm you know up there with my guitar, I can do some other things and fill in some other parts and things like that. Right, that can't right, do right. Setting. So right. Uh, having to sing gets in the way of me doing what I really want to do on the guitar. And if I'm not in a position to translate these songs well in that setting anyway, there's no reason for me to do it. Right. Um, so it gets, it, gets, uh, it gets hard sometimes knowing what information to give him about the song. Right. Yeah, I was going to was gonna kind of that. ask to get a little more granular on that. It was like... Is it sometimes just sort of trying to convey uh, what your sort of central feeling is about the song? Usually, like, yes. Here's what I'm like. Here's what I'm trying to say. Yes. And now find right. a way to say that. Right. And there's an added layer with Peter too, because there's a lot of times that we've run into this um, this this wall where um, he doesn't really know what a lot of the the idioms are that I mm. which right, I didn't right. even really real I didn't realize how many uh, kind of idioms I use until I was trying to um, <laughs> to teach these songs to somebody for whom English is not his first language right, right. so I'm like, yeah, I would oh, imagine what does that mean things that we just kind of automatically know what they mean granted, and I'm like right? oh, yeah, how do I explain right. this to him like, like six of one half dozen the other right, or something exactly. like that right so. exactly and, I'm, and specifically that one I'm like well that means that they're the same and he's like well why don't you just say they're the same I'm like because that doesn't like this it's a lyric right right and, right, right so yeah um so trying to like having to backtrack and go you know things that we just kind of take for granted we know right he's got to parse it out a little more yeah, right yeah right. exactly he's like right. it doesn't make any sense i'm like i know i know it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> i get it no yeah i know <laughs> right, <laughs> just right. Get over it. it doesn't make sense but here's what it means right. <laughs> no it, and that that in itself is an interesting sort of area to to look at when you're thinking about writing because uh, it makes you really realize just just how we have this shared sort of mythos of language uh, that we take so completely for granted right you know yeah and there's times that like he'll <laughs> it's funny he'll be over at my apartment we'll like be going over a new song and I'll write out the lyrics you know for him and you know I'll sing it and he'll he'll look at the paper and he'll be like um, no no, yeah, no, because <laughs> he's like I'm not singing all these words, and so he'll start, and I and I give him pretty free license to to rearrange words and cut out words as mm -hmm. he needs for his, you know, job, you know, right. Um, but there are sometimes that he'll want to cut words out. I'm like, no, you can't do that because like that it, one really matters. It changes the meaning of this. Right, I'm right. like, but you could say it like that, and he'll like, why can I do that? But not, but not that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't so. make any. But that's that's good, right? Because it makes you like think about your stuff right. in a more critical way yeah. too. Yeah, and as a songwriter, then I have to, um, you know, writing writing songs for for somebody else's voice, which is you know newly coming up. Yeah, um, yeah. It's like okay, well, I I don't. I, it doesn't do me a lot of good to just write songs for my voice anymore. Right. I have to consider. Right. It, and that's, other person's that's a real different. And, that's a like his range seems is like totally a completely different, different way of writing. Right? I mean, yeah, I feel like I would struggle with that. That'd be a real learning it's not curve easy. for me. Yeah, yeah it's not easy because it's because it's changed. Right? right, and you're so yeah. you're so used to writing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a ritual. You write because this is what the way you right it comes out for you. And, and yeah, and with vocalists like. Like, if Eddie wanted to, to change the key of a song to make it easier for him to play, I'd be like, no, practice up. 
But if Peter needs to change the key of a song, I can't just tell him to have a different voice range. So right. Like if right. he needs to change right. the key of the song, we need to change the key of the song. There's just nothing right. I can do about right. it. You know that that has to happen. And so, right. Um, <laughs> it makes me a better player for sure. Sure. She's sure. never a maybe guy either. It's like no. No, or, or like, no. Okay. no, no, <laughs> like, no, zero. No. Nice. Um, so going back a little bit to some of the early days of writing, um, do you have a, you, you talked a little bit about some of the music that was in the household as you were growing up. Um, looking now, looking back or, or, it doesn't necessarily have to be like who were your inspirations at the time, but from a songwriting perspective, who are some people that you really look at as like, this is fucking killer songwriting, right? Ian Anderson. Ian Anderson. Yeah. Um, so after I got, you know, I hit about 11 or 12 and I got my own feet <clears throat> under me with my musical tastes, um, you know, because when I first started playing guitar, um, you know, my parents didn't really care one way or the other if I was or wasn't. But, um, but you know, my mom and my stepdad had pretty good taste in music, so I was lucky that way. Um, and then I got my own feet under me with my own taste in music. Um, started listening to a lot of Pink Floyd. I think twelve-year-old boys all do, I guess. Um, and then it was my. Uh, my seventh grade English teacher, Mr. Wonder, <laughs> who found out that I was listening to Pink Floyd. He's like, check out this Jethro And he's like, check out Jethro Tull. And I'm like, <clears throat> and I, I remember, it was like, I'm like, who is Jethro Tull? He's like, no, right. Jethro. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, so I'm who's like, that, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, I didn't know who this was. I'm right. like, who's Jethro Tull? So, um... I think I asked for some Jethro Tull for Christmas just so I could check it out, and my uh, my uncle got me some Jethro Tull. What was the first album? It was yeah. uh, it was Thick as a Brick. Oh, nice. Yeah, that my, <laughs> that's, that's what I dove into. Yeah. yeah, that's what I dove into, and I'm like, I think I had the same moment that you probably had with uh, with Graceland, with Graceland, where it's like, wait, you're you're allowed to do this? Right, right. This isn't off limits. Like you can, you can do this. Right, right. Oh, well, you can do anything. And from there it was, uh, you know, Aqualung and War Child, and I took right, out my right. my collection. But um, uh, I'm I'm guessing that if if Peter could build a time machine, he would go back to that moment that I got my first Jethro Tull album, and he would swat it out of my hands. Interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because uh, I think that um, my my tendency to be very complicated and noty on the guitar as well as very wordy probably came from my influence of listening right. to a lot of Jeff right. Tull. Yeah, he did have some pretty heady lyrics yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course as a guitar player I always wanted to be David Gilmour. Um, but I, I, I realized at some point that I can't be the songwriter that Ian Anderson is and be the guitar player that David Gilmore is because they're just not they don't mesh together well yeah <laughs> and since I um, Jethro Floyd could be yeah real since I definitely I lean I lean more toward the the songwriting end of the yeah, yeah. spectrum I kind of just lean that way but right yeah I you know I didn't hear Jethro Tull till I was in college a friend in college who turned me on to them. The first album I heard was Songs from the Wood, uh -huh. which was I was already into the kind of acoustic stuff, and I didn't even realize, like, you know, I was like, man, these guys are awesome, but I thought of them as, you know, like, all the stuff I was listening to was, like, the songs I loved were, like, uh, you know, well, acoustic sort of stuff, like Sure, Brick is a Brick, yeah. uh, or Fat Man, I love mm -hmm. that song, or, yeah. uh, Everything from Songs of the Wood is very, you know, very chill and mellow. It wasn't right. And then I heard Aqualock, I was like, wait, was this even the what? same band? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> totally. And no, the answer is no, not really. Not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but man, yeah, that's. I One lyric from Jethro Tull has always stuck with me over the years, and it was uh, 
simple, but it's uh, skating away on the thin ice of a new day. Yeah. yeah. That is such a great line. It's yeah. just one of those lines that just, it's just up there, you know? Yeah. Love it. War Child. It's on ten album. Yeah. Mine was Benefit. Benefit? Benefit was album. great. That was my Benefit was great, yeah. It's actually probably my one and only. Really? Oh. Yeah. Now, do you know much about, like, did he write those songs, like, pretty much himself? Uh, I don't know much of the dynamics of that band. Yeah, he wrote most of the, the material for Jethro Tull. Um, with some, I mean, speckled in here and there with, like, if you look at the credits, there's specklings of other band members in there. Right, right. His name is, you know, okay. plastered across every single one of them. So who else is in that pantheon for you besides me? Well, clearly, I, mean, I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even expect it. But, yeah. Uh, as far as songwriters that I always look up to, um, that's a looking back, right? Not like, or or even today. I mean, whatever you know. So I, I think that right now, if you were to ask me who like my favorite songwriters are, just for, yeah, yeah, um, I would probably say. Um, Nico Case. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think she's. Um, I think she's a genius. Honestly, I think she's like she's brilliant as a songwriter. Okay. Um, as a lyricist, um, as an orchestrator, like like she's just got this ability to to find the exact right wording to pull out the the thoughts and the feelings in equal parts that mm. she intends to and not feel like she has to prolong or belabor the songs to right. to get those right. points across and she right. like she she's just so good at lasering right in on the the nugget that she needs to find right right and saying well, here it is I right chipped right. away all the stuff you didn't need and here's <laughs> what you need right so um, yeah definitely I would I would put her well up in the in the top five of right of songwriters who I think just have it. Do you have like so I know for myself like I have various songwriters that I like for various reasons. Like if I'm thinking lyrically, there's certain songwriters like for example John Prime, right? Amazing lyricist. I love his lyrics, but I don't think of him as like like I wouldn't look up to him as a songwriter in terms of the gestalt of songwriting per se because most of his songs he writes to very sort of traditional country patterns you know what i mean like they're not he's yeah. not doing anything yeah. you know it's not like king crimson where i might think of like oh i'm gonna listen to king crimson because it's like got this something happening That's there completely different experience yeah you know what i mean but maybe not with lyrics or whatever you know mm -hmm. so do you do you have people like that where you're like oh i like this guy when i'm thinking about music theory I want to listen to this or when I'm thinking about lyrics I like to listen to this um, I it's hard for me to separate them because like let me see if I can come up with a, a lyricist that I a songwriter that I think is a great lyricist but not necessarily a good mm, yeah nobody comes to mind right like it's really hard for me to separate those two right things. right um, and like if you've if you've got some some great instrumentation going on, but you know you hit me with some just some bullshit lyrically, I'm like, oh, you just right, it. right, yeah, no, so I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit that. It's way tough too. for me to separate those two things right. in there, and it's not like I need all of my lyrics to be like, you know, witty or heavy or any like like I I enjoy I enjoy listening to like One Republic, you know, mm -hmm. I really like like their stuff. I think it's great pop music. Um, they put on a good show. Their lyrics are nothing special, but right, right. But it's fun. It's good music. You know, I, right. I like listening to them. I like listening to Interpol. Right. right. Um, although they're you know, they've got some lyrics that are a little more complicated. Right. But right. but I wouldn't like listen to to Interpol and go wow they they changed the way I look at the universe. But right, I, right. But right. I love their sound. I really yeah, yeah, do. Yeah, I love their sure. sound, you know. For so sure. and and uh, I think they've got some great songs. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, it, it's but it's hard for me to to separate those two things. I mean, if I was listening to to you know a band that sounded like Interpol but was but was hitting me with some you know hit me baby one more time type lyrics, I I wouldn't right. listen. Right, right. I'd just be like, well, I'm I'm not doing that. Like, there's yeah. something else out there that's got to do this better. So. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Um. Okay. You're about to write a song. What are your rituals? Do you know what I'm asking? What are my rituals? Do you have songwriting rituals? Uh, I don't specifically know what you're asking, but uh, there's a, a certain way that if you if you walk in, like if you if you were to like be able to put a, a camera on the on the which wall I have, of my apartment, which I have, okay, yes. I, I, thought, I thought I saw that, <laughs> and, and see me writing songs, you would see. An open notebook on either end of my apartment. Okay. And me pacing back and forth okay. between them. Uh, I always write songs standing up. I always write songs walking back and forth between these notebooks. It's not because I. It's a ritual. It's because I can't think if I'm not doing that. Okay. I have to be in motion, and I've got to be fidgeting, and I've right. got to be talking to myself right. and looking. I mean, up that is kind of a ritual. I mean, it's, and then I'll sit know, down and I'll grab up the guitar and I'll play through something. I'll be uh, and I'll walk back and forth and sing to myself and. Do you normally, you, do you start generally with the music when you're writing? Yeah. Like a chord yeah. progression? Yeah, it would be rare that I would start with a lyric. Um, I'm trying to think if there's an example of when I've actually started with lyrics rather than something instrument. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't I'm not sure I ever start with lyrics. I've, you know, sometimes I'll have like a specific little s snippet of a lyric that will come into my yeah. head, and then I'm like, I need to put that into a song somewhere. But it's that's different than you right. know, people that just write down lyrics and then come up with a song you know, to fit them. I, that I, I don't understand that process. No. Although I have done that. Um, uh, there's a song on our album called Bruno Lupinar that um, started with somebody else writing lyrics and handing them to me. So, yes, I remember re hearing about. Uh, yeah, so about I that. have, I have had to, I didn't have to, but I went and. Uh, actually, that was a weird. Um, that was a weird meeting of uh, two different uh, impetuses for writing the song. I had these lyrics, and then we had a song challenge to write a song where the tonic doesn't appear until the. Chorus, I think was. I remember the, that one. Yes. And so I'm like, well, I've got these lyrics, and I've got this song challenge, and um, wrote the song to fit the challenge, played the song to fit the challenge, and then promptly went back and rewrote the song to make sense. Right. Right. And so that yeah. happened. So I have I have had lyrics that I've had to write music to, uh, but typically when I'm going to write a song, they, I don't. It's rare that I just come up with one of those two. I've never just come up with an entire set of lyrics and not write a song. Right. It's never. Uh, but I've also, it's been rare that I've come up with an entire, like, guitar part and then gone back and, I think Clairvoyant was one of those rare examples. Usually they kind of limp each other along right. at the same time right. and change each other as they go. Right. <clears throat> when you, once you have a, a chord progression down for a song and then you're, you're, you're going in and you're writing lyrics for it, um, do you have to hear it, or do you can you hear it in your head? Does that make does, does my question make sense? Okay, so like like for me, once I've got the song musically in my head, I don't have to be listening to it to write to it, right? Like I can hear it, right? You know, I could be yeah. upstairs with a notebook and I can write lyrics for it. Yeah, but I've met songwriters who who who, who I don't do that. You know, like they want to be playing it while they're writing it or hearing it, you know, recording. No, I think once I get uh, a good solid foundation on the guitar, if I were sitting there playing it, that would just kind of get in the way. Right, because you know what the cadence is, yeah. and yeah, okay. yeah, that would that would kind of get in my way, and okay. yeah, no, I, I kind of sing it to myself over and over and over and over and over again. It's right, like, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so I want to segue into another song. Okay. And I want to start you down that path by uh with a question that may be unanswerable oh the best kind the best kind. Let's, let's science this 
what's your favorite song that you've ever written and will you play it for us <laughs> do you have a favorite song do you have, like because i know we all as far as we all have those songs that we you know we love all our songs but you know there's some songs where you're like eh, and then there's other songs where you're like oh i love that song <sighs> That is an unanswerable question. Yeah, um, <laughs> I kind of thought it might be, or just one of your favorites, and, and maybe why it's why you like it so much. This is a time to just let your ego run rampant. Um, I mean, why it's a great fucking song? <laughs> why it's a great fucking song? Um, let's play superhero. Ooh, I like superhero. So here's why this is a great song. And I don't know that it's my favorite song that I have, um, but I think, I think about a capo and then tune. I think that it, um, I think it's probably the 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 song that is the is um, overall. Has the best qualities in in equal measures. Okay, I think I know so, what you're saying, right? Like, yeah, there are songs yeah. out there that I think have better lyrics. There are songs out there that I think have better chord progressions and better melodies. Uh, but I think if you were to take all of those ingredients and have them in equal measure, I think this song probably is the best. Nice. I'd say that was pretty well answered. So tell me a little bit about it. The superhero wins. Um, so the superhero ran wins is uh, so the um, the guitar part actually was uh, we had this song challenge. A lot of these songs came from the song project from my uh, time in Spokane, engaging that that group. And uh, this was. Uh, you mean this group, the one that we're actually. Yes. Broadcasting. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's correct. Um, in the, uh, you know, the, the Andy Rumsey, Gabe Knox, Carmen Sipes yes. days, you know. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't mention everybody's name. Uh, <sighs> Scandal! Geez, scandal. Uh, so we had this, we had this challenge to, like, write... An instrumental part and then give that to somebody yes. else to write a song yes. with. So I wrote this guitar part and I'm like, I'm not giving this to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I think I was supposed to give a part to to Greenberg. And I'm 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 sure I did. I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't this one. This was the one that I wrote, and I'm like, this belongs to me. Yeah. <laughs> so I kinda I kinda okie doked it that way. Um and uh, it's gone through a couple of variations. It was in other time signatures when I wrote it first, and then I played the song in 4-4 four, four for a long time because I was playing it with my loop pedal and right. you know, doing some improvisation over the top of the progression and stuff like that. And then when I started Tinfoil Top Hat, the, the first drummer for Tinfoil Top Hat was um, Wyatt. Um, Sick. Yeah, really good drummer. That guy was a sick drummer. Yeah, and he's like, well, why don't we do this in seven? And I'm like, why don't we? So we did. Um, and then that kind of stuck. Um, that did give me some headaches on the bass, let me tell you. Yeah, it's it's given some people some headaches. Uh, we, I, you know, we try to be as smooth as possible with it. Um, and the So that's where the, the instrumentation came from. And the lyrics, I, I won't delve into them like, too terribly much but I mean I'll, the it, it's a song really about about hitting rock bottom and and what is it what does that look like and, and how do you tell somebody um, you know do it again get up right you know right. just keep getting up. get up yeah. you know when you tell somebody you know it's gonna it'll get better you know that might not be true Right. That you don't know that. That could be bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah. Um, but it, it really is a song about what it looks like when you are at the bottom. Gotcha. Personal experience? 
I mean, I know you've lived yeah. a life of pleasure <laughs> and privilege, but uh, surely there must have been some point at which I... you felt like you did rock bottom. <laughs> I have learned all of my lessons the hardest possible ways. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Don't live my life, kids. <laughs> I did it so you don't have to. So this is actually this is the superhero wins, and it's the title track of the album that we released in July, which can be found on all of the streaming services. I found it on Spotify this afternoon. It's on Spotify this afternoon. Before I forget, while we're on the topic, there's a we've got an acoustic single releasing tomorrow on Spotify. We've what? got an acoustic version of um, Moon and Lupinar going out tomorrow Smoozle. on Spotify, which is, I mean, Peter just, ugh, it's tinfoil top hat is the name of the tin band. Tinfoil top hat, yeah. And and as I mistakenly wrote it in my Facebook event, it is four words. Four words. Yeah. I wrote tinfoil. Top hat. Right. And two words, but it's tin four foil words. Too fat. Yeah. Yeah, it's four <laughs> words. Tin foil top hat. I thought it looked weird. I was like, it looks like tough hat. Yeah. Yeah. T F T H. Too fat. Too fat. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, we got the acoustic lupinar going out tomorrow. It was supposed to go out today to line up with this. But we went with a different distribution service that we won't be using again. Which one are you using? Uh we usually use TuneCore. Yeah, that's what I found. And we like TuneCore, but we decided we were going to try um, Spin Up. Okay. And uh, they're putting our single out a day late, man. Mm, a dollar short. Go! Have you looked at Distro Kid? Or no, or? we haven't. I've um, heard good things about them. I've heard good things about Distro Kid. I think Eddie has used CD Baby. Uh huh. Um, I just use TuneCore because. Is what I'm familiar with. Yeah, so, same here. That's, that's what I started. I don't using. have. There's no master plan. Yeah, right. I just use it because that's what I always use. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Superhero wins. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Also be noted that the uh, album that we released in July has you playing bass on that song. You know, I always liked the bass line I had. <laughs> <laughs> you always know, like, like the bass on that song. Yeah, you are you are on that album. Oh wow, playing bass on that song. For our audience, uh, I was the first bass player for Tinfoil Top Hat. That, that is true. Yeah, <laughs> and now gladly replaced by. Inimitable. Inimitable. <laughs> how long have you been in the band now, Eddie? About a year now. About a year now. And how yeah. did you guys uh, meet? How did you? There was he put an ad in Craigslist, and uh, this sounds sketchy already. Yeah, it's the best <laughs> way to start any band. What did his ad say? Looking for men <laughs> to to play music yeah. with. But it, well, the main thing he put in there was it, it was uh, they weren't prejudiced about sex, plot, age, and <laughs> my man right there. And he, yeah, when I saw those three letters, I said, "I'm calling." All right, call us. And he's talking about touring and recording. I said, "Oh, this is right up my alley. This is what I want." So, right on. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, I have this weird habit of putting together tours that I've got no business going on, and then. <laughs> And I do, do a lot of shit. Anyway. I do, yeah, I do a lot of shit that I just shouldn't be able to do, and it just seems to. Just I just do it. Like, yeah. Yeah, it do. I remember when I went on the, um, went on that first tour with uh, Andy, and uh, we were just driving south of Bellingham, and uh, and uh, Lindsay texted me. She's like, "Oh, I'm so jealous! I can't believe you guys are doing it. You guys are living the life that I want." And I'm like. Nobody handed this. You can do this. Right. Like, right. And now she is? Yeah. Like, you can do this. She's doing really well, too. Right. Yeah. Like, there, there you go. You can do this. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, she kind of amazes me, really. It's because she's amazing. Yeah, she is amazing. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what does it. Because I mean, when I first heard her playing, you know, it was she, at the song project, and it was that singer songwriter thing that she did. Yeah. And it was, you know, right from the get go, she f opens her mouth and and plays a song, and it was like draws you in yeah. like that. Yeah, she does that. And then she doesn't even that's not even what she wants to do. Yeah. She wants to just rock and roll, and then so she did that, and she just fucking owns it. Yeah. She's one of those people you know that you come across from time to time who just have the ability to just kind of you know now i feel like i'm falling back into the trap we were talking about at the beginning of like just the talent thing but right but there are people who just who seem to and i know this is not to denigrate her process because she is a beast when it comes to practicing mm -hmm. and and her dedication to the to her craft is is very technical and very uh, a huge part of what she does but she also just you know she's got a, a really uh, she seems to be able to manifest what she wants in ways that other people find very satisfying yeah and that is something yeah. that not all of us can do you know what i mean like yes, even I when we can manifest the things that we want to do it's not always the things that everyone else goes oh my god that's amazing i'm glad you're doing this <laughs> yeah right yeah <laughs> I get that. I get. I get that a lot. Where I, I manifest the things that I intend, and people are like, "Whatever, Foldy." <laughs> <laughs> so I have a kind of an opposite question from from what I asked before about what your favorite song was of yours, and it's not what's your least favorite, but do you have songs that? Because I, I mean, as as a songwriter myself, and I've written so many songs over the years, some of them just kind of bore me to play, mm -hmm. right? Like. There's like some songs where it's just like, ah, oh, do I really, am I really bothered to play this song again? You know what I mean? But there's, do you have any songs where you kind of have that feeling about, but that audiences really like them? Yes. Now my worst songs I never play. Okay. And by worst I mean. Yeah, I'll say, what's that criteria? Th that criteria is, um, even if I did this as well as anyone could, this isn't what I need to be putting out in the world. Okay. This okay. is not fair enough. It's not yeah. something that if somebody could 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 say if somebody could could take what I've said here and and do it perfectly, mm -hmm. I still wouldn't wish that I had said it. Okay. Okay. So I don't I don't play those. Okay. What about songs that you do play? You know, I remember we talked before a little bit of that old bones where you kind of felt like that was sort of a throwaway. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think they're saying that you don't like it, but yeah, and and that one, um, I guess I'll tune up. Uh, there's a song on the album that I did, in fact, just throw away, and people kept asking me to play it, and I I never expected that anybody would want to hear it or like it. Um, <laughs> but enough people asked me to play it that it ended up on the album, and there are people that are like, oh my god, that's really good. I'm like, thank you. Which one is that? Viagra. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that song. Yeah, people do. And it's one of those songs that, um, and, and, and I've got to, I've got to choose my, <laughs> my words carefully here. That was one of my, that was one of the songs that there's not a single lyric in that song that is different from the way it was put on paper the first time okay. my pin hit that page. Sure, sure. So, never worked on it. Right. There's not a single chord in that song that is different from the way I played it the very first time I played it. Right. Except that it's in a different key now. Right. Um, to accommodate Peter's voice, but the progression is identical. Mm. I put that song, so I put those chords and those lyrics down on paper, and the only thing that has changed is the key that it's in. Right. Yeah. So it's... But see, I don't know that that's... Is that really saying much of anything? I mean, I, I feel like it's, some of the best songs I've ever written would fall totally into that category. Yeah, I think if... There's nothing in that song that, that, I, that I don't necessarily mean to say, but there's a whole bunch in that song that I think I probably could have said... Oh, okay, sure, sure. Yeah. I um, but I never worked on it because that wasn't the point of writing it. Yeah. That was one of those song a day 
two yeah, albums yeah. that I was doing. So I just I literally wrote that song in one day and put it in the notebook and moved, moved on. on. Right. But I I played it once at the song project and never even thought about it again. And then somebody I don't even remember who it was. Somebody asked me to do it again, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I did, and then uh, people liked it. People still like it, and I I don't want them to not like it. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I demand you hate this song. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that I want people to not like the song. Hate, it's just hate. it's just one of those songs where it's like it's not even that I don't like it. It's that I don't I have a hard time claiming it. I think okay. Is, okay. Is more what. Right, to say. right. It's like I have a hard time saying, you know, I really poured my heart and soul into this. Right, right. Because I really didn't. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> also saw it like that. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So it's and it's not a bad song. I'll right. Play it. I'll Good play or bad, it. it's just yeah. It's just like it wasn't my yeah. Right. Like I didn't I didn't you know open up my vein and drop my blood onto the page and you know write this song with my with my heart juice you know. <laughs> right. And so like. But people, like I, I tell people, you know, I just, the, the lyrics or whatever came out, and they're like, oh, so the, you know, the song's not about anything? I'm like, well, that's, no. It is. Just because I, you know, had thoughts before I moved my pen. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, the song is definitely about something. It's about, um, I mean, the song is about uh, uh, being taught a whole bunch of false things, and then being forced to make choices in life based on those falsehoods. That's what the song is about. Um, oh, I, I, uh, the title of the song has changed, actually. It was something else before, so I lied. I'm a liar and a fat mouth. Have you considered calling it, like, Sildenafil or something to avoid so a lawsuit? Generic, a little more generic. No, I have Viagra heard. is a no, I actually trademarked hope, name. I right. hope they sue me. I could use the publicity. Right, okay, there you go. Sue, <laughs> sue me, please. Please sue me. So, um, a side note to the makers of Viagra, whatever company that is. Sue uh, me. There's a guy out here in Seattle who is using your your the good name of your drug to make music. And I don't even use your product. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. even use the product openly. There are just better products out there. Like Spanish Fly. Like Spanish Fly, <laughs> exactly. Um. <laughs> for real? <laughs> yes, for real. Okay. So you, you clearly have, uh, well, you know what, that was a great intro to Viagra, so why don't, why don't you just do that, sure. and then we'll, then we'll move on from there. I do want, you've got a new song yeah. to play. Um, I would like to hear Celeste, okay. if that's okay. I, I don't want to dictate what you play. We could just, I have a question about it, but we could, we could just do the question. So you can play whatever you want, but okay. um, it's, I just want to make sure I'm not, we don't really have to stop at a specific time. We don't time. have to ever stop. We can just go on forever and ever. Forever and um, eternity. Which is super awesome. Batteries run out. Uh, it's 8.30 now. Um, I was looking to, to kind of do a uh, uh, 9 o'clock, sort of a two-hour okay. thing. But if we run late, that's fine. So however many more songs we want to play. But I like Song. talking a lot, too. That's one of the things we didn't do as much in the last Right, which I guess iteration. is the whole point of doing it this way is right. to actually have the have conversations, more conversations that we were hoping to have before. Yeah. yeah. So, Viagra. Viagra. It's a great song. Everybody's going to really Would you say it. that this song is hard to play? It's hard to play if your fingers are stiff. Interesting. Yeah. Ironic, even. Yeah. Yeah. So it's better if you have sort of flaccid fingers. Right, so that you can stroke, stroke the neck a little better. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wait, when it was in the other key, was it easier? It was much harder. Oh. Did the song stay hard the whole way through? It stays hard the whole way through. That's, I think, one of the great the thing things is, about a song like that. If, <laughs> like, if, if, if you if you find yourself playing hard music for more than four hours, you probably should see a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> we're never going to be allowed that time. <laughs> two different songs here that we haven't discussed about that I've written down a line of lyrics that I just want to get sure. some more clarification. Some feedback from you. Yeah. People can go listen to them online if they Okay, want to. so in Celeste. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, the, my favorite, one of my favorite lines uh, of yours. Uh, That's when he left his mark with a flint and a wheel and a spark. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. What does that mean? Is it specific? It's specific, yeah. You don't have to tell me if it's something specific you don't want to reveal. No, it's but. fine. It's it's literally a song about a uh, a girl who cheats on her boyfriend, so he burns her house down. Ah, okay. I mean, that's that's what the song is about. Okay. So, is it about a real thing, or is it a... Oh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but not specific so, to you. So, yeah, I mean, the song... <clears throat> 
there, the, it takes elements from real events that I knew about um, and mixes them with fictional events. And in, in the real events that I know about, the, the, the gentleman in question did not get so far as burning down the house of the offending girlfriend. He did, in fact, though, scratch the word whore in the trunk of her car. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Huh. That happened. Do you write songs for specific people ever? Or, you know what I'm saying? Uh, people can... They old or not? People can inspire me to write songs, but they... It's... I can't think of any example where it stays there. Like you haven't had like like say an ex boyfriend where you're like I'm writing a song about this motherfucker. <laughs> no, I mean I've had a lot of them that have like been thrown in the mix, but there's nothing ever. I guess nothing yeah. ever stays in that headspace. There's not. There's not. Um, and it's not that I couldn't necessarily. It's that I think that anything that is. Is it all interesting to stay to say? Can't just stay in the jilted lover mm -hmm. category. Sure. There's nothing sure. interesting to say there, and everything not very interesting to say there has been said in not interesting ways countless times. Right. So while that's an experience that we all have, and it's it's useful, I think, to kind of rope in some. Some kind of universal experiences yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to to communicate with people. Right. Um, anything that's going to stay in that in that space is just not something that I. I'm not. Even, I'm not even sure I'd be capable of writing it. Okay. Knowing me, like. Right. I just don't think I could even stay in that headspace long enough. I mean, I'm not sure I could get a whole song out of it. Right. Right. You know, there's like, yeah, I kind of feel the same way too. But but so so I guess it sounds to me like you do something similar to what I do, which is like I will take specific things that have happened or specific people that I know, and they find their way into songs. But like for example, I wouldn't write a whole song about my experience with a specific person, but I use that to inform maybe a more generalized message yeah. in the song. Like, I'm still drawing yeah. on my own experience, but I'm not like, you know, uh, Martha, you know, slaps me right. in the face. Right. But Martha slapping me in the face is going to somehow inform what I'm writing. Right. And I may make a veiled reference to it. Like, I know right. there's writers, and that's, I guess, kind of where I was getting at. It was like, do you, do you, do you put a veil over personal experience when you bring it into a song? Or are you pretty? Or are you? Would you say Martha slapped me in the face? Or would you be like the flit, the wheel, and the spark, which is kind of a little bit removed? You know what I mean? Or poetic version? I would. Do, I, I would Does I that would, question make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, and I would give myself permission to do either one of those things, depending on which one I thought were more <laughs> appropriate for the song. Okay. okay. So, like, if let's say uh, you know, let's say I were in an, uh, an abusive relationship with Martha, right? And I'm. I'm, Poor Martha. I feel now we're beating up right, on this fictional and, Martha. And Martha is constantly like, you know, slapping me in the face. I don't think that, like, I, I, I don't think it would be very interesting to write a song about <laughs> an abusive relationship where Martha is slapping me in the face. I just don't think that would be very interesting. I wouldn't find enough inspiration there to write a song about that. But I would. And that's not to say that somebody can't. I think every song yeah, is yeah, different. Yeah. I'm just not kind of wired to think that way. I think a more interesting song would be to write about um, how I, you know, you know, treated the the poor guy at the mini mart who I was buying Gatorade from, and like I would, pro I'd be more likely to write a song like, like spewing all of my vitriol at him. And I think right. that's a more interesting moment. And then mention, and it's all because Martha slapped me in the face and you had this coming. Gotcha. You know, like, like, like gotcha. that's just a more interesting right, way right, to right. come at it, you know, for example. Um, uh, 
or if uh, or if I was in a perfectly healthy, good relationship with Martha, but she slapped me in the face, I think it would be a more interesting song to to write about. Um, you know, all of the good things about Martha, all of the beautiful things that I love about Martha, and I love the way she slaps me in the face. Right. And right, that's just right, a more right. interesting way to come at things. So, right. um, in that in that sense, I would give myself permission to, to use that line. Right. Um, but do you ever do you ever use like? I'm trying to think like how to. Okay, so like for example, in my writing, when I'm writing lyrics, I will sometimes do a veiled ref up uh, or. I will describe details of something that is real with zero reference. So nobody listening to that song is ever going to get, you know what I mean? I might be like, like that day at the top of the stairs. And that might be all there is in the song. Sure. Now, to me, that means something. Right. There's a specific moment I'm thinking of at the top of the stairs. I made that up, but, right. but the point, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but then I don't offer... A reference context, point. Yeah. I don't offer context. Yeah. Do you ever do anything like that? You probably. Let me think if I can think of an example. I mean that because a lot of your songs have these almost, kinds of details in them that are really. sort of unexplained. Sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like even this, like the the, the line I said there. Uh, that's when he left his mark with a flint and a wheel and a spark. You don't ever really say in the song like he burned down her house. Our house. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's offered without a real context to right. it. Yeah, so, uh, so okay, well, I guess we'll talk about Celeste. Um, I li I, it would seem... not very interesting and trite, frankly, to, to, you know, write the line, you know, she had it coming, so he went and torched her house, you know? Right, like, right, right. Like A little too on the nose, sort of, yeah. Yeah, like, like nobody who's not... In third grade, <laughs> needs to listen to something so matter of fact, right? You know, we right. don't. So, but you take a song like Celeste, and the song, the lyrics for that song came from three very different places. One was a song prompt challenge where we, I don't know, we pulled something out of a hat or rolled dice or something. You had lists. Of a person. That was the, the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you ended up with the girl and the writing a novel on girl the train. writing a novel on the train. And I'm like, well, that's fucking lame. Right. What am I going to do with that? Right. <laughs> I'm going to write a song about a girl who cheats on her boyfriend and burns her house down. Yeah. Um, so, so I got that obviously fictional prompt. Right, right. I mean, that. It came. It was random. A random prompt, <laughs> right, you know. Right. We rolled dice, I believe, to come up. Yeah. With it. It was, yeah. Yeah. I think it was dice. Yeah. yeah. And so then I combined that fictional prompt with this girl that I used to know, who, who this something had happened to her. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then this, and then I used uh, lines from this. Uh, I'm almost ashamed to say that my friend that I had had prank called this guy, and and he. In the middle of this prank call, I won't go into what the whole thing, and it was only funny in the moment, but we had prank called this guy, and like in the middle of this prank call, he's like telling us like the best wood to use if you don't want to leave DNA evidence, and we're like, what the fuck, dude, you got us all sideways and shit. And how old was, were you when you did this prank calling? Way too old to be doing prank calls. Okay, so this is a couple years ago. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And that's where I got the idea. It's like, oh, if I put all these things together, oh, oh, now well, I have the DNA. Now I have a, about the DNA. Now yeah, I have yeah. a story. Now I've got all the elements of the story. Right, so right. completely disparate parts. I'm like, okay, and then right, right. I then the story comes out in my head, and I'm like, okay, well there it is then. Huh, that's cool. And the flint in the wheel and the spark, of course, is just the the lighter, yeah, yeah. That, psh, right, right. I wasn't sure, like, here just reading the line, I was like. Is referring to maybe a, an abusive, you know, parent like burning their their daughter's arm or so. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it almost sounded something like that to me. Like yeah, he left his mark. I was thinking like a scar. You right, know. right, right, right. Yeah. Do you ever have that happen where you've had somebody come up to you and talk about your music with you, and they've gotten something from a song that is completely different than what you intended? Uh, usually Peter. <laughs> it's usually Peter. 
Where yeah. someone just comes up and says, like, man, that song about blah, blah, blah was amazing. And you're like, well, wow, that song wasn't even remotely about blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, I mean, you write pretty directly, I, so maybe that doesn't happen to you as much. It definitely yeah. happens to me because I write very vaguely. <laughs> yeah, very abstractly. Yeah. 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 Um, I did have, I, I, I get that sometimes with, um, I get that sometimes with Die in My Sleep, mm. which is a, a line that's easy to confuse that way. I don't necessarily fault people for making that, kind of getting that line wrong. It's not, I mean, the, the, the point of that song is, is about um, choosing to retreat back into superstition and religion and ignorance and, and uh, huh. give up on any kind of lucidity so that you can wrap yourself in this blanket of foolishness and right. that's that's what dying in my sleep is in that context right but, but that line can easily be taken much literally. more literally than it sure. was intended to be sure. yeah. well you know that's it's interesting you brought that up because one of my questions i had on my sheet was do you feel like there's any overarching sort of thematic gestalt to your songwriting uh so uh, because i feel like in our discussion of some specific songs we keep touching on some of the very same themes yeah the rejection so, of magical thinking right i do i do uh, quite a bit of of god bashing and religion yeah. bashing <laughs> in my in my but, songwriting. well I, but i don't even know if it's that I, I feel like it's more like just bashing uh you know mythical narratives it, yeah, as a way of thinking it doesn't have to be god it, it's it's I, I i i hope and i don't know if it if it happens i hope that it's more of an encouragement to people to to grow up yeah yeah and realize that there's more magic on this side of that door mm. than there ever mm. was on the other side of that door right right um the, the world that we live in is a much more fascinating and inspiring and beautiful and wonderful place when taken for what it actually is. Right, right. Than when trying to pretend that it's something that it's not. Right. And I just would, my, my religion bashing is not just to, you know, call people stupid or, or that kind of thing. It's to hopefully encourage people to to say, well, maybe I should poke my nose outside this door right, and see right. what outside actually looks like. Right. Instead of staying in this little room Looking with through paintings the paintings of the outside. <laughs> right, 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 yeah, yeah. That somebody yeah. told me was what the outside looks like. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and the, the, the world we live in is a much more fascinating place as it actually is. Yeah, I agree. It really is. So yeah. that's that's kind of my encouragement to people. Um, I don't know that I always come across with that, um, but I, I was mentioning, I think I was mentioning to Eddie the other day that um, I discovered that the word maybe comes up quite often in lots of my lyrics. And so I, I ha having examined them on, you know, for more than a few minutes, uh, I, I discovered that I end up asking a lot of questions. Uh -huh. I ask more questions in my lyrics than I than I definitely than I give answers to. I gotcha. Think. Um, and I just started noticing, like, oh, that song has maybe. Oh, oh, that song has maybe. Oh, I get a <laughs> lot of mileage out of the word maybe. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's weird when you when you look at you analyze your own stuff like that and you find these things that you didn't even like. I use I use snow as a metaphor. Yeah. Like in way too many songs, and I just. It's not something I ever do consciously. I'm not like, oh, I need to let's throw something about snow in there. Right. But there's certain there's certain images or uh, patterns that are so ripe for being used in a broad series of ways. Do you know sure. what I mean? Or metaphors. Or, um, and what's that that line in that? 
to speak the word and I will bloom in the snow. I'll bloom beneath the snow. Bloom beneath. And that's such a loaded sentence. Right. In so many ways. Right. Right. So, yeah. But it's vague. Right. Right. But it. But to me, it has a real like. Yeah, you know, it's like the idea of like even underneath this curtain of. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I don't want to even talk about my sauce, but. Uh, <laughs> But it does it does make me think like I think one of the things that really first drew me to your songwriting is that even though maybe to the casual listener you would have never put you and I together in terms of a songwriting umbrella, mm -hmm. um, I think we share a thematic uh, sort of gestalt to what we do. Uh, you know, I feel like almost everything I write is in in some angle or another coming at the idea of uh you know getting over yourself or sort of the dis the, put it in more buddhist terms like the disillusion of, of the dissolution of the ego mm -hmm. being sort of the the key to waking up to the real world you know and i feel like there's a, a, a sort of a simpatico i think so theme yeah. there yeah. with both of our uh, sort of overarching things i think you say your theme more clearly than I do. Like, I think when I tell people that as a theme of my writing, people are like, hmm, well, you know, like from your songs, they're like, who would know, right? But but I definitely feel like there's, you know, that's something that, that runs through both of our things. And maybe that's partly why I was right. you know, drawn to what, to your writing. Yeah, I think, you know? I think it's impossible, well, not impossible, but highly unlikely to have been writing songs for as long as either of us have without um, gestating some kind of underlying philosophy. Right, right. right. Um, regardless of what it is, you know, we might be writing, there's, there's a foundation of the way we think and the way we come at the right, world right. That, that lifts up and supports all of the, the fruits that, that come yeah. from that. So, yeah. Um, if there weren't, I, I we would have quit a long time ago. Right. Or or we'd be pop songwriters, right? We you know where you could start rewriting songs for other people all the time, yeah, and not really yeah. having and any kind of yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, which is know, to, yeah, totally yeah, cool. If you get you know nice work, if you can get yeah, it, yeah, no right? shit. You know, <laughs> um, it's a gig I would do if I right. could. Um, but it's it's a slightly different kind of thing. But it's yeah, because you're not writing. And if if know. that you know even if I got that gig, it certainly wouldn't be the only music I write. Right. You right. know, as as an artist, there's got to be something else that I do. Right. That. And I guess it's natural, right? Like I mean, that's just what people do, right? Like I mean, uh, anyone like a writer, like Neil Stevenson, for example, great writer. Love him. Definitely thematic elements that appear again and sure. again and again uh, because how can we help that right I mean that's you know we have these thematic elements in our lives they're important to us right. why wouldn't we write about them <laughs> it'd be right. kind of it's kind of now I feel like it was kind of a stupid question <laughs> well I, um, I I think I think about my um, I think about my my songwriting um, kind of in the same way that um so, like, Stephen King says that when you when you first start writing, you write very autobiographically. Yeah, yeah. And then you get away from that, and you go right. write other things. Right. And then at some point, you come full circle, and you begin writing autobiographically again. He mentions that at that point, you stop. <laughs> and I would say, well, why? Um, but I would also say that, that as is indicated even in his own body of work, he's still always tethered. Sure, to there's this. no way to not, yeah. Right, yeah. like how many stories can you set in, you know, Maine? Right. Before you have to admit that maybe it's because, I mean, it's this, this idea of, you know, you want to write something that is not just completely autobiographical because you, how many times can you do that? But right. you still have to write what you know, right? Whether you're writing fiction or writing poetry or writing songs, songs right. or whatever it is that you're right. creating, you have to create something. You, you know, you can't teach what you don't know. Right. You have to create something that you know. Um, but if you stay in this kind of 
introverted autobiographical space, you'll eventually run out of <laughs> anything interesting to say to anybody else, yep. anything therapeutic that you could possibly have said to yourself, yeah, yeah, and it becomes something kind of toxic. So right, right. I think it's important to 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 get to to anchor yourself there, but to not stay there, right. to not live there, right. Um, Nice. All right, well, what do you want to play for us next? Oh, I like that one. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I'm gonna, let's, let's play Old Bones. I think it's, I think, I think I shouldn't come here without playing it. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because of what I just said. Uh, this is one of the songs that probably gets as far away from autobiographical as I ever this is the uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez right, inspiration. Yes, yeah. Um, so there's almost there's almost nothing autobiographical in this song. But I'll bet there is. But there's yeah, there are those little pieces, right. and 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 you will you'll you'll notice you'll have to hear the that that underlying philosophy of of um, encouraging people away from superstition, which was easy to write with this song because. Yeah, yeah. Marquez kind of fell into that right he's also same yeah yeah can um, and yeah so this song was written as an homage to Gabriel Garcia Marquez and was kind of intended to elicit that sort of uh, same feeling that magical realism elicits in a reader of fiction um, and he's he's one of those people and they're they're out there they're there are certain people that I think I mean, we're, we all matter, um, and it's not just that we all matter to somebody. I think that we're we, we all if there was a, a, a driving biological imperative that brought each of us onto this mud ball. So in that sense, we're, we all uh, on a very basic biological level matter in the evolution of our species. We're all threads in a fabric, right? Um, there are some people that the world is just a better place when they're in it. Yeah, thank you. And he was one of those people. Oh, right. You, yeah, are, yeah. you are also <laughs> one of those people. <laughs> no, I do. I know what you mean. Yeah. And so I, 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 when I encourage people to go read his work, I, 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 I like to tell them that through all of this kind of fantastical, magical realism, uh, he, he painted a picture of a world that made more sense mm -hmm. through it. And there are certain writers that, that just kind of have that. He had it. Um, Salman Rushdie has it. These people that can, that can just show you a world that is the one that you live in, but one that they would encourage you to engage in. Mm. On, a, on a more active level than you are. Right, so, right. Um, in that way, I think that that the world was a better place and a world that made more sense when he was in it. So I thought he was worth writing an homage to. Okay. Um, had a song prompt. I don't remember what it was. Didn't matter because I was already planning on yeah. <laughs> writing a song for him. So, What are the old bones? Huh? What are the old bones? So the old bones roll. The old bones roll, and of course, as a lyricist, those there's always those double meanings, right? Yeah. So think of dice. That's yeah. one of the meanings, right? You know, um, you know this this idea of, of gambling, but uh, in this case, the the old bones also refer to. Um, so in the in the novel One Hundred Years of Solitude, uh, this woman shows up at the Wendia house and she's actually got the bones right. of her parents in a trunk that she's carrying with her, and every so often those bones will clack together. Right. And uh, the idea is that uh, when the bones of your ancestors begin to clack. And are unsettled, 
You should probably pay attention. Because that's usually not a good omen. <laughs> Copper coins and silver lights Peep through keyholes odd and wide-eyed We'll forget our names and feel no shame But angels all have muddy wings Tether them to trees, then beg for mercy On the streets of Santa Fe Where the old before about that song and how uh, musically it's so much more straightforward than most of the stuff that you write yeah um, and that that's probably partly why everyone loves to hear it. <laughs> not not to say that the stuff you write is not lovable yeah but, I mean, but it's but it's it. the, the the cost of entry is slightly higher yeah yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because I mean, you're you know a little more you're a little more of a technical writer in some ways, so, mm -hmm. or a, you know it's it's a little denser. Yeah, that's a good like that's a good like get them in the door type of song. You know yeah, what I mean? Because yeah, yeah. it's like easy to sing along to yeah. and and. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> Agreed. I do not have a bunch of other questions. Um, one that is going to just be like a. <clears throat> You know, this is what every hack is going to ask um, stuff. Um, and that is maybe a couple of uh, Desert Island uh, albums. What would you take with you? 
Oh, how many do I get? Two. 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 I get two albums to take with me. On two albums to listen to for the rest of your life. Oh. Well, and you can't just list both of my albums, Paul. I was about to list, <laughs> I was, I was about to list mine. <laughs> Even better. Um, hey, get over yourself, right? To, just to plug it again. Um, Jesus Christ. That's I amazing. know, I hate questions like that. I'm sorry. Apologize. So, um, two albums for the rest of my life. I would actually, uh, so I would put... Um, I would put Middle Cyclone. What is that? By Nico Case. Oh, okay. okay. That would go on there. Um, I think uh, as an overall piece of work, it just holds together probably as well as any I've ever heard. Mm. Um, and as many times as I've listened to it, I've never gotten sick of it. That is the key right there. Yeah. Um, even even some of the albums that I grew up listening to, like um, I haven't listened to The Wall in years because I was doing that, but I got sick of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm not with those classic I just, stuff. I just, like, just probably spoke some blasphemy into the air. Right. I mean, it is. What no, it I'm is. exactly the same. Um, I mean, even even my favorite Jethro Tull albums, I probably haven't listened to in, in quite a while. Yeah. But I would put um, I would put a Jethro Tull album on there. I would put a Passion Play on there. Which is an album that even a lot of Toll fans consider unlistenable, mm -hmm. but I just I think it's, it's speaks to you in some way. Yeah, I think it's just solid from start to finish. Uh, how about you, Eddie? Oh, jeez, that's a long one. Um, for me, it'd probably be uh, kind of blue. Oh yeah. Like Oh yeah, it's hard to forget. So. Yeah, I'm not gonna listen to that all day. Right. Yeah. The only downside of Headhunters is it's not very many songs. I know. You gotta listen to it your whole life. Yeah, it's like That's it's true. like four songs. On it. One's kind of long. Too. That's true. Was that Watermelon Man? I think is the really long one, or is it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Or the other side, I think. Yeah. Nice. Those are good choices. Man. I approve. You can tell I don't listen to words that much. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, you know, it may, when you're, you, you said kind of blue, it made me think about, like, the, one of the reasons I hate questions like that so much is that I tend to think about it, because there's so many ways you could go about thinking about that, right? Like, are you asking what my favorite albums are, or are you asking, like, what I could stay listening to for the rest yeah. of my life? Because I could see going your route when it comes to the technicality of, like, all right, what could I put up with listening to? Over and over. I don't have to hear the same phrase right. over and over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I guess that's kind of, I guess it's sort of running around the question because I guess it's, it's just a way of saying what your favorite albums. Yeah. Those are good though. I was listening to like Miles Davis. Well, he was, that's an interesting thing like with Miles, right? Like by all accounts, the guy was just a pretty rotten scoundrel of a human oh, being. God, yeah. <laughs> you read his book? I have not, but I've oh, I've, read I've book. heard some excerpts from it. Holy um, God. Yeah, not the nicest guys. Uh, and the whole idea of separating the artist from the art, I, I I'm sort of fascinated with. Like, do you have trouble with that, or like, are there people that you, if when you find out somebody is like a a scoundrel, does it affect how you hear their art? Should it? Oh, those are different questions. They uh, are. <laughs> I'm trying to think of an artist that I admire that I later found out was a scoundrel. Um, I, 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 can't, I don't know that I've had that Like, can you watch anymore. Kevin Spacey movies now? Sure. Yeah? Yeah. You're able to sort of separate that out? Yeah. yeah. I, I can separate. Or Bill Cosby? Could you watch the Cosby Show? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess. I mean, it's still I, good writing, yeah, I guess, I or you know. Yeah, I wasn't. Like, you know, yeah. 
I mean, if we're going to go into that that space, it, it's easier with somebody like like Kevin Spacey because um, as an actor, his craft yeah yeah is right. is different than somebody like Louis C.K. where the material is his craft. Right, right, right. No, I know what you mean. So it's like it's like right. you know if you go watch. I mean, there, there are certain Kevin Spacey movies that I can't watch because they just suck. Like, right. I'm not going to watch K-Pax. It right. just blows chunks, you know. But, um, but like, if you go watch, you know, Pay It Forward, he didn't, he didn't write that. Right. You know, so it's like, right. yeah, I mean, I can, you know, I got no problem watching Yeah, because he's not, he's not himself. He's yeah. not, he's not, that, like, that was a whole right orchestra of people all plying their trade, and he, um, he's good at his trade. Right. Usually K-Pax right. sucked. Um, yeah. But if you look at somebody like Louis C.K., it's hard to separate the art from the scoundrel, especially once you kind of see the scoundrelishness and you go back and watch some of more of the stuff. It's like uh, it gets a little cringy. It was. It's, I mean, it's different. It, it was always kind of cringy for me. But but you know what I mean. Like so, as far as like a, a musician who I know is writing the the material that they're putting out and they're not just you know playing like if i you know found out that you know the the bass player for a band that i really liked had gone out and you know beat the crap out of a you know woman or something i wouldn't stop listening to that band i mean i mean he he sucks but right you know, he, you know right he, but i wouldn't necessarily look any differently on that material yeah, yeah. And i wouldn't stop listening to it because i find out that you know right. he's a, a scoundrel i you know Right. Um, but if you know I were listening to a band and you know they had these really edgy lyrics and you know it was just like really you know like intense stuff and then I found out that the guy that was writing the songs you know was like keeping puppies' heads in freezers I'd be like oh yeah yeah this okay. isn't edgy yeah. anymore right. this this is not edgy. This needs to so, not be in my home, right, <laughs> you know. So right. I think it just that just it depends. Yeah, yeah, you know? I, I agree. That's 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 probably because yeah, I mean, like, so to answer the no, next question, should it? It depends. It depends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right? Because you like you say some like kind of blue, right? That's that's just a masterpiece, no matter how much of an asshole Miles Davis was. Right. Doesn't change that the music was great or. If, you know, the, the statues of Michelangelo were amazing, even if he was a serial rapist. I mean, I'm, I'm not making any claims. I'm just saying, like, right. yeah. there's certain, you know, art is art in one yeah. sense, right? But I think the question usually gets asked in um, in reference to Wagner, who was a... There you go. ...raging anti-Semite. Right, you right. Know? And it's like, well, does that, does that make his work not good? Right, right. It does. It is good. It is <laughs> good. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. There was a there was a great. Did you ever watch that show, Curb Your Enthusiasm? I didn't. Larry David. Yeah. Genius yes. show. The guy is sure, love it. such a genius. Uh, but there's a great scene in there where he's humming a, a Mahler tune. He's a Jewish guy, you know, and some other Jewish guy outside the theater hears him and comes up and is like. Totally rails into him like you self hating Jew, you know. Why are right. you listening to Mahler? And of course, the episode ends with him hiring an orchestra to play Mahler in this guy's front yard, <laughs> which is super nice. awesome. But no, it just made me made me think of that. Um, I think the, the the best example of that question recently has got to be Roseanne, though. Oh yeah, there that's, you go. And that's a tough one to. That one I don't watch anyway. I mean, people fall into one of two camps usually, and I'm not one of those people. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I can, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one to. Right. It's a tough one. Right. She makes it hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like that with. I mean, I guess Bill Cosby in a way is like that, right? Because yeah. his image was so wholesome. Yeah. Bad. So wholesome. The bad. You know. you know, he was America's dad, and I mean, that's a pretty skeevy thing to find out about down the road it makes it like, i haven't watched the cop i don't, I don't, I don't I, just generally watch the cosby show randomly I mean, yeah but i'm not sure if i wouldn't put on it if i went to youtube and put on the Cosby show ex excerpt if i would how i would feel watching it i don't even know 
Yeah. Because he's not like Kevin Spacey, where you're right. I think if someone's an actor, they're putting themselves into a role. It's not really, you're not really watching Kevin Spacey. Right. You know, you're watching yeah, something yeah. else. I mean, can we ask the question, do we do we stop watching any movie that, that Harvey Weinstein produced? You know? Exactly. That's a good point. That's a good point. Ton. And how I mean, many people are putting out music or art or something that we love and they're total jackasses and we just have no idea. Right. <laughs> like, wow. Especially since, I mean, there's, there are ways, I mean, it's, it's, there are ways to be a complete trash human being that keep you well on this side of the legal line. Right. So, I That's mean, true. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, if we want to look at people's behavior and, right. do, you know, do we support this or do we not right. support this, then I think there are, there are bigger fish to fry than True. that. Like, if we're actually going to talk about, you know, how we make our choices in the world, you know, stop buying Nestle products. Right. You know, I mean, there are just yeah. bigger fish you to know, fry than that's, this. That's true. And that, that's, know? you know, I've been seeing some memes uh, recently about that kind of thing where, you know, like, sort of poking fun at this, you know, they're coming out, that people are saying, um, oh, you know, to do your part about climate change, here's some things you can do, you know, and then people are responding by saying, like, you're giving us these like little chintzy things. What really needs to happen is companies like Nestle, and right? Exxon, and, yeah. You know, you, you just you're telling us we have to be responsible for this mm, right. <laughs> by what using less wrapping paper, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. While while are these multi multinational corporations are dumping you know millions of tons of crap into the yeah. air every year? But I should stop smoking because. Contributing to climate change or whatever, right? Yeah, it yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. So, I think I think it, it just depends on the situation, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, I brought that up because clearly you're a monster of a human being, and yet you produce these nice songs. So I am, I am that was sort of where I was leading with. I'm, I'm, I'm trash <laughs> as. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the bottom feeder of the species. Don't they call you the uh, the uh, Jeffrey Dahmer of music? Uh, they they did until I turned they? vegan. Until I turned vegan. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And uh, did George Soros pay you to say any of the things you've said tonight? No, he did I'm not. I'm required to ask this question. No, he did not. <laughs> what? What happened? <laughs> well, let's hear a couple more songs. I mean, we're going to hear your new song. Okay. And... Um, and then let's see how we're doing time-wise here. It is 9.20. Um, so yeah, give me a new song, and then maybe I'll do one last song after that. Okay. Finish it out. So, I've spent so much time with Tinfoil Top Hat working songs that I've already written that I realized when I sat down to write this song that it had been a while since I'd yeah, yeah. written the material. And uh, that's when I actually started thinking about the... Stephen King philosophy about coming full circle with yeah. autobiographical material because this one is pretty autobiographical, probably the most autobiographical thing I've ever written actually. Um, which is weird that I'm following up one of the least autobiographical songs I've ever written with, with this one. Um, well, what about uh, I was I was curious to to, to find out if uh, now that you're in this situation with the band you're in uh, where you've got someone else singing your songs has that ch like now you you're going back you're writing a, a new song are you thinking about that more in the process of writing you're like okay this is peter's gonna be singing this or do you still just feel like you're writing the same way you did with this one i didn't think about that okay um because i was writing this song more for this setting and and in a lot of ways to to get back into finding what that means to like re-engage that part of my brain because mm -hmm. um, writing a song from scratch is just very different than orchestrating and rewriting yeah, and yeah. editing and things like that yeah. um, in a lot of ways rewriting and orchestrating and rehashing and editing all in a lot of ways that's much harder yeah yeah um, so it's kind of like you know I sort of it's it's easy to sit down and write a song and kind of give yourself a pass to just go well if it's just me and the guitar and yeah, the mic, yeah then I can get away with a lot of things you know um, 
So I try not to get too uh, complicated okay. musically with this. Um, because I know that I have a tendency to like go a little too far down that road sometimes to the point okay. where it, it, it can it can alienate listeners. Um, which is just not I don't think a good artistic choice. Uh, I think it's important to give people something familiar so that you can engage them, but also something that's interesting enough that it you know holds their attention for more than one listen. Right. So um Do you already have a baseline for this or is this yeah. Oh yeah, we're going nice. to work for it. He's never heard it, actually. Yeah, that's right. Never heard it. <laughs> <laughs> um not sure what all to say about it really. Um we could start with the title. We could. Were we so inclined? And were we to have one. Ah, okay. Uh Boy, right out the gate with questions I can't even answer about my own song. Name the Where song go? right now. Go. Where to go, Dick? <laughs> um, I'll tell you what. You play the song, I'll name it afterwards. Okay. That seems, right. <laughs> that seems fair. Yeah. It's um, called Dick Lips. <laughs> dick Lips. <laughs> I write a lot of songs about... Um, and how people kind of equate loss with like we have these two things that we're allowed to to write about <clears throat> in in popular music we can write about love songs or we can write about breakup songs and those are kind of the two things that we're allowed to write about it's sort of two sides of the same coin yeah and since that's kind of what we've been given permission to write about um, the masses kind of have only been given permission to hear that right Right. So if you talk about loss, people think of love lost. Right. Yeah. And so I say that because this, this song is actually uh, about that. <laughs> 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 but in, 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 in sort of different... So I'll, I'll, give the, I'll give a little bit of background here. So um, I, as I mentioned before, I tend to do things that um, I have no business doing like organizing tours and producing albums and I seem to just go ahead and roll with it and do things that I want to do that I'm not waiting for somebody to give me permission to do. So I was on my, I've gone on four tours in the last three years. And let me tell you, that is a lot of work. Yeah, no shit. That is a lot of work, and and uh, this last one was the most work. But anyway, uh, so four tours in three years has been a lot of work, and I don't regret uh, a single moment of it. Um, so my second... I was... I. Put in quite as much work as 